All right. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the Simons Institute. Uh, my name is Peter Bartlett. I'm the Associate Director here. I'm very happy to have you here for this uh, final workshop from the, in the Causality Program. So we're a collaborative research institute in theoretical computer science. We run these uh, semester-long programs two each semester, and Causality is one of the two this semester. Um, very happy to have it running. A big thank you to the NSF for its support of the program uh, through FODSI. Um, it, the program brings around 90 long-term visitors to Berkeley uh, in, in total uh, and has a bunch of these activities. Um, this is the last workshop of the program, Quantum Physics and Statistical Causal Models. Um, let me start with a big thank you to the organizers, uh, Thomas Richardson and Frederick Eberhardt. Uh, thanks for putting together a great, great program for this week. I'll hand over to Tom to introduce the workshop in a moment. I wanted to say a few words about logistics. So you've discovered the food and coffee outside. You'll have that during breaks. Uh, please don't bring that inside. Water is fine, but we try to keep the auditorium clean. Um, for lunches, you're going to be on your own. Uh, there are plenty of options and, uh, you know, follow a local or a long-term participant if you, if you need some advice. Um, masks indoors are recommended, but not mandatory uh, right now. Um, uh, at lunchtime, if you want to leave things, or anytime, I guess, if you want to leave things in, um, in the building, there are lockers on the far side of the building at, at, on this level uh, that work with a pin code. Um, and we've got uh, a hybrid format. So we're, we're using Zoom. Uh, Omid Farr is our videographer, and he'll be helping all the speakers hook up their computers and, and set up microphones. Uh, and finally, a big thank you to um, Ashley Hassan, who's at the back, and Keilani Penland for all the local arrangements for this workshop. Thank you. So I'm going to keep this short. Right? We're uh, already running a little behind. So uh, welcome. Thank you for coming. And I, I know we're still at a point where it, it's a real commitment to come here uh, in person and you know, also to all of those that, who are watching at home, um, uh, thank you for participating. And uh, yeah, I, I think all, that, all I really want to say is that um, I was very excited at the prospect of uh, putting us, um, having a workshop on this topic, because um, yeah, I've been aware for some time that there are interesting synergies, that there are um, uh, people in different fields thinking about very similar and related problems. And I think the we'll see that in the talks that uh, take place in the workshop and i would also like to thank the Simons institute for uh, for for putting this uh, allowing us to have this workshop and also for the semester long program on causality which uh, has been a great success um, and i think without further ado i will pass it over to robin to uh, introduce the first speaker thank you very much okay so our first speaker today is ellie wolf who is a research scientist at the Perimeter Institute in Waterloo, Canada. Um, and he uh, has interests in uh, self-test of physical theories. But today he's gonna to be talking about applications of the inflation technique for causal inference. Thank you very much. Uh, it's really exciting for me to be here. This is not just a great workshop that any workshop is a great opportunity to travel. This in particular, I think, is a meeting of fields which is long overdue, one which I'm really excited about. And I have not felt like I'm going to learn something from attending a workshop to the extent that I'm excited about this workshop in a very, very, very long time. Um, so thank you, Thomas, and, and the organizers. This is really excellent. Um, so I wanted to talk about um, the inflation technique, which is some uh, material I, I came up with with my uh, colleagues to test causal compatibility. Um, if we have a causal structure, it's a hypothesis, um, can it explain our data? So we have some methods to do so. Um, I'm going to introduce it, but it, it did come out like four years ago or something. So I'm going to introduce it fairly quickly and spend most of my talk on um, what happens when it gets hard. Um, but let's take a slow in the beginning. Um, so physicists came to study causal inference um, by way of Bell's theorem. Bell's theorem is from 1964. It's a result in quantum physics, which says that if we make certain assumptions about nature of reality, such as um, influences not propagating faster than the speed of light, such as uh, the possibility of free choice, um, then modulo those assumptions, the predictions of quantum physics cannot be classically explained. 
Um, so it appears to be a, a really exciting result in foundations of physics or in philosophy, but what does it have to do with causal inference? Um, and one way of understanding it is to say, oh, well, Bell wasn't using the language, but it's actually um, a statement about causal structures. So here we call this the Bell DAG, directed acyclic graph. Um, I've denoted A and B as variables which represent the outcomes of quantum measurements. If you're familiar with Bell's original experiment, X and Y would be sort of the settings. Um, and there's a hidden common cause which could potentially lead to correlation in A and B. Um, and um, this codifies the cumulative set of assumptions that went into Bell's theorem, like freedom of choice. What is freedom of choice? It means that the experimentalist who is you know, about to do some quantum experiment can choose some uh, setting in an apparatus and that that setting is in fact not dependent on anything else in the causal past of the universe, not dependent on sort of like the initial state of the universe, which might have sort of like some giant quantum state, which predetermines how the experimentalist is thinking as well as the results of the experiment. And so we just denote by that by saying, oh, look, the variable X, it doesn't have anything in the causal past. It's independent of everything else. That's just a way of codifying free choice, which is a philosophical assumption with causal language. Um, so if, if we take those assumptions and we express them all in this causal diagram, then this is the idea of classically explaining a quantum experiment. If these statistics that we would generate from A and B and X and Y are compatible with this causal structure, then great, everything works the way that we expect. And if not, then one of the assumptions is wrong and how you choose to interpret that, um, there's disagreements in the camp among physicists. Um, but just preliminarily, um, if we make an assumption about causal structure and we wanna sort of test and falsify, is it a valid explanation? We'll notice that um, there are equality constraints and inequality constraints. So an example of an, uh, an inequality constraint is a Bell inequality. And so here I've written it with a less than or equal to sign. Um, but we also have equality constraints, which physicists would call like no signaling equalities. And that might tell you that um, uh, if you take the, the value of B and you fix a particular Y, so you're looking at um, the instance of B when Y was set to some value, um, B do Y as it were, um, that this is a well-defined variable um, and uh, it is well-defined in the sense that it doesn't depend on the variable X. So if you do this experiment and you, you toggle X to different settings, um, you should not see that the distribution over the variable B should change, right? That is a constraint, it's an equality constraint. Um, now, some of these uh, are gonna be uh, the things that we're going to end up violating when we actually move beyond classical physics. Um, but the, the idea um, that we've endorsed here at perimeter, or not here at perimeter, but at perimeter, is that when the quantum experiment is not explained by the data, not necessarily, when the data is not explained by such a causal hypothesis, we have to throw it out. We say this is not a valid explanation. So there's Drake, the Canadian rapper, saying it's not acceptable. What is the version that is good? Um, so we might, uh, if you were in sort of different camps, posit maybe there is superluminal influence or things like that. But for now, I'll just assume that we're just working in um, a broader notion of a common cause. So the idea of a latent variable is just sort of a usually a, a random variable that we just don't see its value. Um, and so if we're gonna do things quantumly, we're no longer gonna make that assumption. We're gonna say that there's a possibility of random variables being common cause connected, but not by way of a classical hidden random variable. We would call it sort of like a quantum hidden random variable if we'd like, um, or a quantum entanglement. And that's, these are sort of the same structure, but with different assumptions about the nature of the hidden variables. Um, and it leads to different predictions. So, uh, our, yeah. Can I ask a quick question? Hmm? Your interpretation where you were moving this arrow y. Uh, just yes, in your interpretation where you were explaining this first inequality, mm -hmm. I want really to understand why this inequality is derived. Is because you have an inequality because you have a range of magnitude where you could detect the violation or why it is not exactly an equality and then you get that inequality. Um, so I'm not talking about um, uh, a particular experiment per se, I'm talking about the set of all data that could be explained if the classical assumptions were true. So it turns out that the quantum data is not gonna fit at all. But if we just said, what are the sort of statistics that we might ever see? 
right? So the probability of A, um, the probability of A could be 0 0.8. It could also be 0 0.2. So already we have the possibility of, of an inequality there because the probability of A taking the value zero is somewhere greater than or equal to zero and somewhere you know, less than or equal to one. These are trivial inequalities in a sense, but they are inequalities. So the set of statistics that are compatible defines a, um, a volume. And so if it's, if it's not a point, if it's a volume of statistics, there's gonna be inequalities involved. I see. I, I, I guess I, I got that. My intuition was like to try to understand how this is was related to your intuition of moving in the in the experiment of moving that Y. Um, yeah, the, the inequality is not. Um, uh, that's more sort of the equality, but let's talk about that afterwards. All right. So um, one of the things that uh, I have been motivated to do is to try to understand um, what are the predictions um, what are the constraints that are classically implied if we assume that the Bell structure is everything's going the way it usually is, that if we move to quantum physics, these constraints can be violated, right? Because not everything can be. Um, in fact, if we look at these two hypotheses and we say, what are their testable implications? So we've said that they imply equalities and inequalities. The equality constraints that are implied by both of these two competing hypotheses agree. The, where they differ potentially is in some of their inequalities and it's some, not all. So here is an example of an inequality and you can see there it has the upper bound of zero. Here it has a upper bound, which is strictly larger than zero. Um, and so this is sort of like where we can go and see the difference. Um, and finding these sort of inequalities is fun because it lets us validate that in fact, we're dealing with quantum stuff. Um, so that's like the self-testing of a quantum experiment. We get to actually know, oh yes, we were doing quantum things. Um, so just a little recap in, in terms of what is known. All of the conditional independence relations, which are implied by a given causal hypothesis, the separation leads to conditional independence, yeah? Over the observed variables. Over the observed variables. All conditional dependences over the observed variables hold classically, yep. So that's sort of like the uh, ordinary Markov property. Um, in fact, the nested Markov property also holds. Um, so these are uh, in succinct. If there's an equality constraint, which is implied by the classical version of the hypothesis, then when you make a quantum version of said hypothesis, the equality constraints are still there. So if you ever hope to say, oh, look, this is how I'm going to prove that I'm in fact dealing with quantum weirdness, don't use the equality constraints because they're not going to be quantum viable. You need to go to the inequality constraints. So only the inequalities matter. So how do we find inequalities which admit quantum violation? We're gonna to get to that in great depth over the course of this talk. But here's an example of a, uh, uh, a famous uh, causal structure. It's very simple, the instrumental scenario. Um, it has inequalities such as um, this, which is the Bonnet inequality. Um, and uh, many uh, people who are not physicists probably have just seen it with the value of two on the other side. Um, and this is an inequality which holds if you're explained uh, by the instrumental scenario. But if we make things go quantum, it can be violated. On the other hand, there are other inequalities also valid for this scenario, like Pearl's instrumental inequality, where it's not viable. So we have this difference between like Pearl's inequality and Bonnet's inequality. Pearl's is not quantum viable. Bonnet's inequality is quantum viable. So we're trying to understand that, yeah. Okay. Um, so let's try to uh, now go to inflation because that's the topic, yeah? I'm having a little hard time tracking because sure. this isn't the language I yeah. use. It. Good. But I, uh, I just want to ask technically. Yes. Is basically what you're doing when you have these three values, in one case, you're, you're imposing uh, no signaling and in, the, and, and in the other case, you're not. Um, no, Bell doesn't talk about no, quantum, no, no, non-quantum. Uh, that, that, that is not that. It's the only um, term so I, 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 you know, really was thinking if I have to introduce the whole quantum formalism in the first talk, it sucks. So I tried to like skip all this because that's the hard question. Um, but no, I, I am actually assuming that no signaling goes through entirely. What I have not put on the board is a description of if uh, we wanted to describe the set of quantum models, like we could write an equation with some uh, quantifiers that we could eliminate. Um, and it would be those that were trying that would lead to this value. Like if we optimized over the set of quantum models, um, but no signaling would continue to hold. Yeah, I, I, that's what I'm, <laughs> I'm sorry. That's what I'm trying to understand, yes. right? 
I, I think of this just in terms of locality. Okay, you put a locality constraint on the arrows, and then you get Bell's inequality. <laughs> now you put a little like you know green glowy thing, and and all of a sudden that was supposed to change. And I'm just trying to understand if I just put a regular arrow between the two sides, and I can violate signaling as well, right? So I'm trying to understand one of the things you're holding fixed is no signaling, right? Or not? Yes, no signaling is an equality constraint and it is held fixed. Equality okay. constraints okay. go through. That yes. might help me. Yes. No signaling continues to hold when I assume that we get to do quantum effects. So this is a matter of some interpretation, perhaps. Um, but if you interpret Bell's theorem as uh, indicating the possibility of signaling, or hidden signaling, um, then uh, you would be using sort of a different quantum formalism than what I'm using. Um, I'm taking um, that uh, if we take uh, my interpretation of quantum mechanics, then the quantum explanation behind a Bell inequality violation um, does not allow for signaling no matter what you do. Yeah. Really quick, what does GPT stand for? Generalized probabilistic theories. Um, um, so uh, quantum theory is sort of like an example of where classical assumptions break down, and then we can consider a, a, a broader set. Um, and so throughout this talk, um, I'm going to say like, oh, it's quantum valid, it's quantum non-valid, and I'm really going to not be distinguishing quantum and GPT um, because nothing I'm going to say is very particular to quantum physics as opposed to more generalized physical theories. All right, so let me introduce inflation really quickly. This is the triangle scenario, which is sort of what um, motivated us to come up with inflation at all. Um, and so this is a, a causal hypothesis over three observed variables uh, with three hidden variables. Um, and so every pair of observed variables is common cause connected by a hidden variable. Um, so what uh, would it mean for a distribution over A and B and C to be compatible with this hypothesis? It would mean that for every uh, probability of joint probability of A and B and C, it would factorize uh, like so. So there'd be sort of like um, the distributions over the three hidden variables um, and response functions for each uh, uh, observed variable on its parents. Um, so how do we test, right? Uh, without actually uh, trying to find uh, hidden variables, whether or not a given distribution is possible. So the idea of inflation is to um, assume that uh, it's a valid explanation, assume that um, our, our, our distribution did arise in the triangle in this case, um, and then uh, follow implications of that assumption until they lead to a contradiction. So we start by saying, all right, if um, I had some possible way of explaining my data in the original graph, that means there is some distribution over the uh, hidden variables and some response functions which give rise to this, then there's sort of a Gedanken experiment I could do. I, uh, you can think of it as a thought experiment. I could create an independent and identically distributed version of this CA common cause. I don't know what it is, but I could create another copy of it. Um, and then I could uh, take this hidden variable, which is currently being distributed to A and B, and I'll send um, another copy of it off to another version of A. Right? And so now um, I have a, uh, a distribution over four observed variables, A1, A2, B, and C. Um, and uh, assuming that I, in fact, recycle the causal parameters correctly so that this is distributed the same way as this, and that A depends on its two parents, A2, the same way that A1 depends on its two parents, which is the same way that A originally depended on its parents, then we have some implications. So we have the original graph over ABC, the inflation graph over A1, A2, and BC. Um, and we're going to see sort of like what happens. So um, I want you to sort of follow these three steps, which is uh, how inflation works. We imagine the inflation graph, which I just drew. We're going to then express certain monomials of probabilities in the original graph as marginals of the inflation graph, which I'll walk through. And we'll note that the inflation graph also implies some symmetry constraints on its own distributions, which come from the assumption of recycling causal parameters. Um, and when we put those together, we get sort of a linear program, which gives us constraints. So first, let's try to express monomials. In the original graph, we have ABC. Is there anywhere where we can say, oh, the distribution over ABC in the original graph is recapitulated in the inflation graph? And it is, it's just A1BC, because it's just the same subgraph. So far, so good? 
And this is sort of a really simple way of saying I found some monomial of probabilities in my original graph. It's just the whole original joint distribution. And I can express it as some marginal of the inflation graph, because here I've traced out H. But there are others. Um, so for example, I could take a monomial, which is the probability of A times the probability of C in my original graph. Can I express that as a marginal somewhere in my inflation graph? Well, yes, because if I trace out a and B, and I look at just the marginal of A2 and C, they have no uh, causal ancestors in common, right? C depends on these, which are root. A2 depends on these, which are root. So therefore, A2 and C in the inflation graph should factorize. Of course, in the original graph, A and C do not, but in the inflation graph, A and, two and C do. So now I can say there's a monomial about my original probabilities, which shows up as a marginal in the inflation graph. All right, what else do I know about my inflation graph? Um, I know that there are certain symmetries. Because A1 uh, is really indistinguishable from A2, um, as far as B is concerned, right? Not as far as C is concerned, because C is connected to A2 and it shares a common parent with A2, whereas she, C does not share a common parent with A1. But as far as B is concerned, you can take A1 and A2, switch the labels, and it's the same graph. Right, it's the same calls around. And so this gives me a sort of a symmetry constraint, which is that the, the sub-marginal over A1, A2, and B, if I take the value of A1, and I call it A little one and A little two, I can flip those two values and it should be stable under that sort of relabeling. That's a symmetry constraint. So all of these constraints are just linear constraints on the existence of a joint distribution on the inflation graph. Um, and then I can say, okay, based on that, there exists a joint distribution over the inflation graph, which has these marginals and these symmetries. What does that mean? I can then just pull it out and it's linear programming. And this gives me a linear program. So in summary, um, we say there exists a distribution over the inflation graph, which recovers um, that monomial, which recovers this monomial, which recovers um, sort of a symmetry constraint. We pull it back um, and we end up with an inequality. And this is inequality on the original distributions because everything that sort of went into this were monomials of original probabilities. And so we've now extracted a inequality, which is a, a linear combination. It's a linear inequality on monomials, which is to say it's a polynomial. Uh, and that's how inflation works. Um, and so we get this inequality and it tells us that here's an example of a distribution, which is imagine that zero, zero, zero occurs and one, one occurs each with one half probability and nothing else. That can't happen uh, because it's argument. Yes. Mentioned that A2 is a deeper version of A1. I just uh, want to understand when you say subset is a version. Mm -hmm. I would repeat so that uh, yep. people on Zoom could understand. So um, you mentioned that A2 is a different version of A1. Mm -hmm. um, I just want to understand how, when you say that, what it means. I think for statistical side, maybe we don't have that. Concept. So we mean, we mean that. Um, uh, that uh, they're not only are they distributed the same way, but that if you look at sort of their um, their causal history, um, at every stage, um, all of their ancestors are also distributed in the same way, and they also combine in the same way. So the mechanism by which a one arises is the same mechanism by which a two arises from its root causal history. Yes. Okay, I'm sorry, I just, your inflated graph has now four nodes on it. Mm -hmm. um, we normally think of the, the, the lambdas as entangled states, right? Well, if we want, if we made some uh, quantum- In any case, if we were thinking of it that yes. way, then mm -hmm. I can't actually get all four data points on any single run, right? You, you've preempted the, the whole point, yes, exactly. Okay. Yes. Um, so uh, the, the, the reason inflation is useful is because the, the logic is not quantum valid. Uh, if, 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 if we're trying to write down quantum causal uh, hypotheses using sort of the language of causal structures, then inflation doesn't work. Um, because, um, and, and that's the whole point, which is we want to sort of find a method which relies on very much classical assumptions, which are not quantum valid assumptions. And sort of to see what are the implications of the classical assumptions, which then lead us to these conclusions, which potentially might be quantum invalid conclusions, i.e. quantum viable inequalities. Maybe this will help. Yeah. 
you're sort of thinking it's a classical it. involving the possibility of cloning. 100 percent okay a hundred percent the whole point of inflation is that if you want to get a quantum violent inequality you take your hidden variables and you broadcast them. you clone them and if you if, if your logic goes through without cloning then any conclusions you get from inflation will be quantum valid and if your logic goes through with cloning or broadcasting then there's potential for quantum violation which is the whole point yes Exactly. Um, so I wanted to then just um, uh, upgrade a little bit of the complexity to say that we can do inflation sort of um, more algorithmically as a hierarchy. Uh, and the idea here is instead of just um, uh, drawing an arbitrary inflation graph, you take some set of your root variables in your graph, you copy them so many times independently, IID, and then you just watch what all the implications are thereof. So here I have three root variables. And in this version, I have taken the BC uh, root variable, made two copies of it, and seen, OK, what are all the implications of taking two copies of the BC root variable? So I have now B1 and C1, and I have B2 and C2. And of course, here I've had to fan out um, the, the source, which now went originally from AC, now goes to A, C1, and C2. And the source that was originally AB now goes AB1 and B2. Um, uh, the nice thing about this is that instead of looking for symmetries of subgraphs, it's just the symmetry of the whole graph, which is that I can relabel B1, C1 with B2, C2, and the distribution over all five random variables should be invariant under that relabeling. Um, and it leads to these kind of constraints. Um, the next version would be to consider two of the uh, root variables, let's say the BC source and the AC source, and copy them both twice. And then we get an inflation graph which looks like this, which now has eight variables out of the inflation graph. Um, but it's sort of all of the implications of taking two copies of the AC source and two copies of the BC source. So we call it inflation one, two, two, right? Um, and uh, now we start seeing new sorts of um, expressible monomials because we can take ABC times C and we can express that as the A1, B1, C11, and here there's this C22, which is, has no ancestry with it. And so we get these new uh, monomials that we can express. Um, and then we can go to inflation 222, which gets really uh, ugly looking. Um, but it, you know, these are the monomials that we can express. Some of them are, are quadratic. Now we start having cubic monomials that we can express. Um, and these are incredibly powerful. Just from the fact that uh, we take this graph, we say that it undergoes the appropriate symmetries, which is if you relabel one of the sources, let's say the AC source, the two versions, it induces a relabeling of all of the variables. And it should be stable under that relabeling. So you assume that the distribution over all the variables is stable under such relabelings. Um, and you can obtain these marginals. Uh, we can rule out tons and tons of things. So there's a uh, Marc Olivier Renault was the first to sort of come up with um, an example which has nothing to do with Bell's theorem, in my opinion, uh, um, of some quantum weirdness in the triangle scenario. And can we uh, use sort of any technique which is available, classical causal inference technique, to show that the distribution that Mark Levier and, and Simon BHG came up with is not compatible with the triangle? It's really hard to do so, but this will do it. Yes. Question? No? All right. Um, so now to uh, Tim's point. Um, uh, when we derive inequalities, um, are they always possible to violate them in quantum mechanics? So here was an inequality that arrived from very, a very simple inflation graph. Um, and the question is, can we repeat the arguments if we treat the sources, the, the, the hidden variables as quantum entanglement? Uh, and as Tim pointed out, um, if we make these assumptions, so now I'm using green and psi as opposed to red and lambda, um, uh, can we make such a good knock -and experiment? Is it sensible? And as Tim pointed out, no, it's not, because that would involve broadcasting. And one of the fundamental things which is true in quantum physics is we cannot broadcast quantum states. So if there's this kind of fan out, which is a hidden variable had so many children and now it has more children, this is an, an operation which is classically valid, quantumly it's invalid. And so this is why we're starting to get uh, invalid conclusions, but we can repeat it with um, uh, different versions of inflations, which don't involve this sort of fan out structure. Um, and so like this is the cut. Um, and I wanted to just point out that um, anytime we have a fan out inflation, we can find non-fan out inflations as subgraphs within. So here is like the one to one 
inflation of the triangle. And if you follow sort of the green and only the green, that is not fan out. And so we can then look at the subgraph on A, B1, C2, which is exactly the one on the previous line. This is A, B, C is the cut. Um, and similarly, we can go forth and we can say, oh, look, here's another inflation of the triangle. Um, uh, it's a non fan inflation. Does this show up? It shows up as a subgraph here. Uh, all right. So uh, the last thing I wanted to talk about is if you're familiar with inflation already, and this was not surprising, you might want to say, well, the causal structures that I'm interested in are not just the triangle scenario. I want to deal with causal scenarios which have more directed edges, which are more complicated. Um, uh, how, Ellie, should we deal with causal structures which have directed edges? So let's go to a causal structure which has a directed edge. Here's the instrumental scenario with drawn in notation XAB. Um, and so we can uh, come up with a quantum version here. Um, and so this is the idea of a single world intervention graph, a SWIG. Um, it's in another paper, which I call quantum inflation, referred to as interruption. Um, and the idea is you take your original graph over XAB, and then you have this new graph where there is no edge from A to B. Instead, there's another version of A, which has absolutely nothing that's causal fast. And that points to B. And so this is a totally different scenario. But the distributions which are compatible with this, which we can characterize, it's easier, um, they do relate to that one. Because if the, the intervened version is set to little a, and we're also considering that this a ends up taking the same value, then the, the, it ends up being a probability in that graph. Um, and so if you're familiar with single world and random graphs, this is familiar already. Um, but this is a quantum valid operation. If we wanted to do a classical analysis, uh, we don't have to do interruption. We don't have to look at swigs. We can just do fan out. So we could say, oh, that's the original uh, instrumental scenario. Let's consider um, taking two copies of X. So we have now fanned out. We have inflated X because X is a root variable. And we've taken two copies of X. And we have kept one copy of the AB latent variable. So this is like the, in, for the uh, instrumental scenario, this would be inflation level to one, with two copies of X, one copy of the AB source. Um, and now it's fanned out. Um, and uh, look, the original distribution over XAB shows up, but X also is then independent of the error. So we have a monomial, which is expressible. Uh, and if we run this through, we can derive inequalities. So this is an inflation perspective on how to derive instrumental inequalities. But there's another way of doing it, which is instead of just taking copies, we can introduce a new kind of node, which is A, but it's not all A. It's A when x was set to 0. So this is the do conditional version of A. Um, and this might be a different version of A, which is A when x is equal to 1. Um, and now we can use both of those to induce the fan out um, uh, by saying, that the hidden variable has to tell us what A should be when X is zero, what A should be when X is one. Um, and we can use these to derive inequalities. Um, so let's move on to another version. Um, here is the unrelated confounders graph, which uh, Robin Evans came up with in one of his papers. Um, uh, if we want to derive inequalities on this with inflation, uh, we want to derive quantum value, we want to derive quantum invalid inequalities, what do we do? If we're interested in quantum valid inequalities, we do this interruption and we look at the swig um, and we can relate the original uh, uh, probabilities to uh, certain conditional probabilities over here. Um, but this idea of interruption, it doesn't capture the independence of the AB source from the BC source. So this captures E separation, if you're familiar with that concept. Like if you, if you just run this as a linear program, you will find inequality constraints which are implied, but we can find stronger ones if we can find some way of imposing that it's not just that B is in the middle, but that there's these two independent sources. And to do that, we take two copies, just two copies of the original scenario. And now what inflation will tell us is that um, we can relate um, monomials of the original distribution, namely two original copies, to marginals or conditionals in the inflation graph here. Um, and it's the appropriate symmetry. So if we consider sort of um, uh, the marginal in where we've traced out B, B1 and B2, then I can swap C1 and C2 uh, by symmetry, because that's just relabeling this source with this source, which captures the idea that if we trace out B1 and B2, that A and C are independent. And so the point here is that symmetry of the 
distribution over the inflation graph is a proxy for independence. And so independence is nonlinear, symmetry is linear, but we can impose symmetry and simulate independence or, or the constraints which you like it. Here is a classical uh, version for the uh, unrelated confounder scenario um, where this is sort of like a natural version of inflation. Um, I haven't done any kind of interruption. And so I've considered two copies of each of the sources and that induces now four versions of A because there's the A which sees this source but sees the B which sees this source. And then there's the A which sees the same source but sees a different B, namely the B that was connected to this source. So this is why uh, if you take two copies of the root variables, you can end up with many copies of some of the late children in the graph. Um, uh, so as, I, as I'm finishing here, um, I've done this idea of introducing a swig and not introducing a swig. What's the point? When do we, when do we interrupt the graph and when do we not? Um, and the point is we do this interruption technique or we go to swigs if we're trying to get quantum valid inequalities or if we're trying to do mediation analysis classically. Um, but if we're not doing mediation analysis, if we're just doing causal compatibility, there's no reason to do it. Um, I guess I'll skip a bit because we're out of time. Um, this is just a version of a swig for the unrelated confounding scenario. So if we did uh, just do this interruption and then the inflation, then we have only two versions of A. So is this a quantum or a classical operation? Well, it's, it's classical because we've done fan out, but it's not as classical as it could be because it's only a three-way fan out as opposed to a four-way fan out if we expanded and demanded that C should respond for each of the values of B. All right, um, and so then we have the idea of cross. Um, um, okay, um, in summary, there are three ways to extend inflation to uh, the case of directed edges. There's the version which I would endorse, which is actually the, in the original paper from 2016, um, which is just follow them out. If you've got your, uh, your causal structure, take your root nodes, take multiple copies, find all the uh, implications which follow to the causal descendants, um, and run the sort of usual symmetry uh, and expressible sets. Um, there's a version which um, uses single world intervention graphs. This is a, a, a advocated in a paper called quantum inflation. Um, it's fine. It, it's, if we're doing sort of, if the goal is to derive classical inequalities, you could do this. Uh, I just think it's uh, somewhat wasteful. Um, cross world inflation is the idea which um, we called it unpacking in my paper with Miguel, um, where we take, uh, we get rid of all the directed edges by taking um, each variable and looking at its due conditional for all of the cases of its observed parents. And then anytime we move away from the natural inflation, we have this uh, feature bug, I don't know, that um, if you have a set uh, of variables, potentially subsets of variables might not be expressible. So you might find that like, um, uh, there's a version of B and there's a version of C in the inflation graph and you want to know what's the marginal of B and C, that corresponds to a probability that you know. But if you just take B by itself uh, or C by itself, it might not correspond to a probability that you know. Whereas if you're doing sort of natural inflation, those kind of things don't show up. Um, so the very last thing I'll mention is uh, a particularly challenging uh, graph that uh, Robin put in one of his papers, which is um, from figure 14. Uh, is this DAG saturated or not, are there constraints on the distribution over ABC? So we could use inflation and we will and have used inflation to derive inequality constraints here. Um, uh, and I wanted to point out two nice features about this. One is that if we wanted to do a quantum analysis, um, uh, we could go to the SWIG and we would note that in this particular graph, the due conditional C do A is an identifiable due conditional. So when we go to the SWIG, and we start writing down uh, some inflation, like a ring-like version of 14a, and we want to know what are the monomials that we can express. Well, we have the usual versions that we can express. These are just products of conditionals. But we have also these, which are uh, perhaps not obvious, um, but they follow from the fact that in this graph, there are due conditionals, which are not just um, based on exogenous uh, variables. So, when you have identifiable due conditionals, which are not based on uh, exogenous variables, you can use them in inflation to an advantage. If we're doing natural inflation, and this is the last slide, um, we get to use uh, fancier types of monomials. So here, consider the DC source 
having two copies. And so we can consider an, a version where um, there's this D, which looks at one version of the source, and there's C, which looks at a different version of the source. So I'll call it D version one, C version two. This might show up in a larger inflation graph. Here, what do we know about monomials that we can express? Well, we have ABC, um, uh, that sort of subgraph matches, ABD matches. But in fact, the entire ABCD distribution here is identifiable, not just the three variable subgraphs, even though it's not the original graph. And that's because in this graph, in the inflation graph, you have that D1 and C2 are D separated by A and B. And so all you need is that you can identify the ABD, the ABC, AB by itself, and now you get sort of this new kind of uh, expressible set. Um, and in order to show that um, this graph 14A is not saturated, we can do it at an inflation level uh, one, two, two, as it were. Um, but to do it at a low inflation level, we have to take advantage of these kinds of uh, more general expressible sets. So that's a lot, I know. Um, here are the references. Um, the first three are sort of like uh, lay out the different attitudes. And I would sort of in encourage people to take a look at the later two. Um, Marc Olivier is going to mention one of them, which is if we wanted to do non finite inflation, uh, and only non-finite inflation to derive quantum value constraints. There's a hierarchy which allows us to do that. Um, and um, this was a, a paper where Miguel proved that the inflation technique converges. Uh, if you consider like many, many copies of the sources and pull the linear program back, eventually the constraints uh, on the monomials are indistinguishable from the actual compatible set. Um, so there's a new, very simple proof uh, of that fact, which I really enjoyed. Um, and it's fresh in the archive. Much, Ellie. It's really interesting. Are there any questions for Ellie? Two very quick questions. Your second last slide with a graph on it. Sorry. Yeah. So is that that looks the thing on the right looks quadratic in the observed distribution? Is that right? The constraint you've got on the bottom. Um, is, is that? Is that different from the things you had before? Just I'm just seeing there. I don't think it's really quadratic um, because if you if you wanted to make it unconditional, it would just be that the probability of AC uh, and the probability of AC, which is a, um, uh, a monomial, can be expressed. Um, Sorry. Okay, maybe I should follow it's, up. Okay. Yeah. The, the, the other question was: you had some inflations where which were green, and the others that were red. For example, in yes. the UC quantum analysis. Yes. And is that structurally defined, or is it, is it semantics you're putting? Uh, yeah. I was no. Just there, lost so, so the green versus the red is I, um, when I'm doing the inflation. If I'm making one of these operations, which involves fan out, which is to say, uh, um, there was a child of the latent variable which now there's multiple versions of that child and we're sending the late, the, a version of the, of the latent variable to all of its children, then I'm using red because that's sort of the classical case and I'm following Robin's uh, color notation for index. Um, uh, green is sort of uh, the color I'm using for quantum. And so if, uh, if the fan out inflation does not involve, uh, if, if the inflation does not involve any kind of fan out, then um, I'm using green because it, uh, it's quantum value. Else? Yes. Question from Zoom from Marina Ancinelli. In one of the last slides, you said that interruption is used to find quantum valid inequalities. But what about the use of interruption to go from, instru from the instrumental scenario to Bell and show the QC gap in the instrumental scenario? Yep, that's a, uh, that's a good question. So um, we can... Uh, This is, this is sort of what Marina is referring to. So if we do interruption um, to the uh, instrumental scenario, we end up with this graph, which involves four variables, which is essentially the same as the Bell graph. So everything we know about the Bell graph, we can just apply the constraints here. And that shows us that this link between uh, Bell inequalities and instrumental inequalities. If you know all the Bell inequalities, you can figure out all the instrumental inequalities. Um, uh, and that, that's true. Uh, and that sort of goes through at the level of all physical theories, which is, is the point, right? It doesn't assume classicality. Um, but if our goal here is to derive 
um, new inequalities here um, uh, for this graph. Um, if we had no knowledge of Bell inequalities, um, then in order to derive Bell inequalities, we would need to, um, if we wanted to do it strictly with inflation, we would need to do fan out. We would need to consider A for both versions of X um, or B for both versions of A, either way. Um, and that would take us beyond sort of single world intervention graphs and take us into these sort of cross world intervention graphs. Okay. Any more specific question? Okay, excellent. Then uh, let's thank Ellie again. And I think the next talk's at 10.40, is that right? Okay.